You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Hello and welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast from the Hansard Society about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Every week we're going to be analysing what's going on behind the Gothic facade of Westminster. Helping you to stay on top of the key parliamentary issues of the week and what lies ahead. And we'll be explaining how the system works. And hearing about the latest research and innovations in Parliament and politics from influential thinkers and practitioners. Providing new perspectives from inside and outside of Westminster. And we'll be travelling back in time to some of the pivotal moments in parliamentary history. To help you understand exactly how we've arrived where we are today. So, Mark, on my list for discussion, I've got the Autumn Statement. Big news this week from Jeremy Hunter of the Exchequer. I also want to talk about the latest developments in the restoration and renewal of Parliament, the programme to stop Parliament falling into the Thames or burning down. And we're going to talk to the chair of the Public Accounts Committee about an announcement she's made this week, Meg Hillier, about that. But first, before we get to that, what's taken your eye uh, in terms of other developments? Well, a very big moment in the House of Lords this week when David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, in his new incarnation as the Lord Cameron of Chipping Norton, made his maiden speech before peers as Foreign Secretary. This is the first time in 40 years they've had one of the great offices of state led from the House of Lords, and I think peers rather liked it. He used the occasion to have a little barb at uh, Boris Johnson, his <laughs> one of his... Well, one of his many successes as Prime Minister, uh, continuing a political rivalry that had maybe begun on the playing fields of Eton, or perhaps it's the other way round. Maybe it's actually an Etonian rivalry that's being fought out on the playing fields of politics. Yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting. I saw a couple of peers immediately after he made his maiden speech in the House, and they were buzzing, frankly, as they were coming out of the, the House of Lords chamber. I mean, that sort of sense that they've got a big hitter, a sort of first holder of the great officers of state that's in, in the Lords since Lord Carrington in the early 80s. And, you know... David Cameron, he, he poured charm all over the chamber, I think it's, it's fair to say. He looked to the manor born, but then sort of one of the questions that's going to come up is uh, he's accountable to the House of Lords, he's speaking there in that chamber, but what's going to happen? That's still a, a live question, what's going to happen Absolute. in terms of his accountability to MPs? Absolutely. I mean, David Cameron will clearly know how to tickle noble tummies, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's what I think of as the Roy Jenkins factor. Uh, Roy Jenkins, the great uh, Wilson Callaghan era Home Secretary, Chancellor of the Exchequer was a real sort of parliamentary gladiator in his heyday in the 60s and the early 70s. Then he went off to lead the European Commission mm. for a while. And when he re entered British politics in the early 80s as leader of the nascent SDP, there was a sense that, at least in parliamentary terms, he'd gone soft, that actually he couldn't any longer cope with the rough and tumble of the Commons Chamber. And I wonder if there might be a bit of that with Lord Cameron. I mean, it's not entirely clear yet exactly how he's going to be held accountable to the Commons. And I gather people are looking at that question. Yeah, I mean, the but, procedure committee's yeah. indicated that they're going to do an inquiry. So it's something we talked yeah. about in the last episode. You can imagine, though, that, that uh, certainly Labour and other opposition MPs in the Commons will be sort of slipping on the knuckle dusters wanting to get at him. Mm. And after so long out of politics, I wonder if he'll be coping with that quite as effortlessly as he, he once did at the Commons dispatch box. Yeah, so what, that's one to keep an eye on. The other thing that took my eye this week was that the government got a statutory instrument published a regulation to increase campaign spending limits for political parties and candidates in advance of the next election. In some cases, to increase the spending by 80%. Keep it, wow. and they, the government says this is to keep it in line with uh, with inflation limits because things have fallen behind over recent years. The limits haven't been updated. The interesting thing about that, and particularly for me as somebody at the Hansel Society who studies this stuff, delegated legislation and statutory instruments, I've done research on this for a decade, you know, this is quite a big change, quite a lot of money involved, but it's not subject to parliamentary scrutiny because it's a regulation that's not subject to any parliamentary procedure. But almost all of these could be pushed into the parliamentary arena if someone decided to make an issue of them. You can pray against these things, as the jargon has it. You can force them to the wicket one way or another. I'm 
I must say I'm a bit surprised Labour haven't made a bit more of an issue of this. Well, there's no actual procedure where they can sort of formally pray against it in the normal way of things for these statutory instruments. But certainly members could be asking questions at the dispatch box of cabinet office ministers. They could be asking questions through opposition day debates. You know, we, we could see backbench MPs trying to get this on the agenda. But I mean, the interesting thing here, I think, is whose interest is, it, is this in? I mean, just to be clear, the, the government's brought this forward, but it benefits all the parties the same way. If they can raise the money, if and it's usually the, the Conservatives have a huge financial lead in election spending. Yeah, and the, the suggestion is, though, at the moment, that Labour's doing a little bit better on the fundraising than the Conservatives. So, uh-huh. it, you know, they might not be in Labour's interest to make too much of a fuss. But I do wonder if this will f- can feed into the speculation that there may be a general election as soon as next May now. Yeah, so that that's one of the you know the issues that's alive, and one of the issues with the election is actually the the financial regulations and the accounting processes and procedures for it in terms of what's called the long campaign and the short campaign are quite complicated and you know it all depends on the date of the general election and, and you've got to remember that political parties at the national level yes they've got the party headquarters sort of running these things but they're at the local level in the constituencies you have to manage this because it's it's, it's national spending as well as candidate spending yeah, some people say there's a that's a distinction without a difference these days that parties can flood marginal constituencies where there's just a few hundred votes between them with non-specific campaigning material that doesn't mention the name of the local candidate and bobs your uncle it's national mm-hmm. spending and not local spending. Yeah, and and you know, one of the the issues is that the people who are managing this at the local level are of course a lot of them volunteers, you know, volunteer treasurers in local parties and so on and it's quite a burden on them and a responsibility. So, we'll have to see what happens. Well, indeed. Uh, and meanwhile, there have been some rather interesting goings on at the Commons dispatch box. We talked about the Lords. Another new minister made their debut this week, Esther McVeigh, in her ah, capacity yes. as the Minister for Common Sense. She was taking part in Cabinet Office questions on Thursday morning. And I do find myself thinking, what a bizarre title this is. She's been brought back to the Conservative front bench. She's been brought back into the government with this very non-specific title. And MPs were, were kind of trying to find out what she was there for, what she would do. And A lot of fun was had, I think, on both sides with the concept of who has control, if you like, of common sense. Are Labour the common sense party? Are the Conservatives the common sense party? And I I found myself musing about what the the kind of departmental structure of a department for common sense would be like. Are you um, any clearer after questions? (laughs) (laughs) Not really. I mean, it didn't really question. I I was just envisaging, you know, there'd be an undersecretary for speaking, as I find, and a a minister of state for the bleeding obvious. And, (laughs) And who knows? I mean, if it became a fully fledged government department for common sense, there'd have to be a common sense select committee and you do wonder what horrors might be unleashed by that yes well talking about select committees something that took my eye as well this week was a number of appointments to select committees so we saw that a um, couple of, of, of uh, long-standing members Fabian Hamilton and, and Mick Whitley for Labour got appointed to two separate select committees well two each two each which does suggest something that we've been sort of suspicious of for a while that there's not a lot of competition at the moment for select committee places that the parties are struggling to fill some of the seats on some of these committees because we think that the MPs are not that keen on being tied to to quite you know substantial workloads on select committees and sort of want to be away from Westminster in their constituencies. And I suppose another symptom of building election fever as you say they, yeah. they want to be beavering away with their own local voters rather than on some committee doing some yeah. detailed technical issue that frankly there are no votes in. Yeah and the other one that's gone under the radar and I think is really interesting is the appointment of Kim the youngest MP, of course, just recently elected to Parliament, um, I think he's 25, 26, if that. He was elected in the recent by-election in Selby for the Labour Party. He's got a plum job on the Treasury Select Committee. When again, you know, you would think that there would be a bit of competition for places from Labour backbenchers for that that role. No, no, Treasury not... Select Committee is a big post. Absolutely. I mean, it's normally sort of ex-ministers and uh, you know really quite experienced MPs who spend their time doing pre-appointment hearings mm. on people who are going to go off and serve on the Monetary Policy Committee <laughs> and that kind of stuff. So it, yeah. you know, it's it's pretty high tech action on the on, on the Treasury Committee. And so for someone like Keir Mather to swan straight into such a plum job, well, as you say, you wonder how much competition there was. Yeah, um, he's going to be 
of course, thrust straight into Treasury Select Committee hearings on the autumn statement. So what do you make of all of that? Well, the, I mean, the Treasury Committee always has an inquiry into big fiscal events, the budget, the autumn statement, any mini budgets or whatever that might come along. And uh, it's almost become a, a fixture now. These are quite formulaic inquiries. Mm. That, that yeah, Next Tuesday, for example, they've got the big experts from the big think tanks, people like Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Torsten Bell from the Resolution <laughs> Foundation coming in. I mean, that's it's practically part of the dignified part of the constitution now. They, <laughs> the these guys always turn up there. You know, they're, they're as built into the fabric of our nation as the king himself, I sometimes think. And that's followed up on the Wednesday. Of course, Jeremy Hunt comes along. So the experts kind of tee up the questions that are then asked to the chancellor. It's always very interesting to watch the sort of duo of, of, of Bell and Johnston um, dominating the MPs and saying, this is what you should be asking. These are the big problems. And, and the Treasury Committee sort of sits their teeth agleam taking it all in so that they can they can Ready. regurgitate those <laughs> questions at the Chancellor the next day. And of course once we get past the Treasury Committee then there's the, the question of legislation what what legislation is going to follow the statement so we know I mean the, the Chancellor indicated in in his speech in the Commons that there's going to be urgent legislation as he described it to deal with the national insurance contributions employee contributions change so and reducing... that's, that's coming up next thursday yeah so the government's confirmed that they're going to bring the bill forward for um, consideration in the commons through all its stages next thursday to make sure it's it's on the statute book ready for implementation in in january i mean frankly they i think they could have given it a bit more time than that but presumably it's a relatively short bill yeah short, um, short sweet and simple you know exactly yeah. it does exactly what it says on the yeah. tin and changes the rates of yeah. national insurance as the chancellor outlined and so badabim straight yeah. through the commons in one day presumably the following week it whizzes through the lords in the blink of an eye as well yeah. Yeah. because the lords of course are not allowed to touch financial measures as absolute parliamentary taboo that they do not do that built into the constitution so they they basically more or less rubber stamp it although someone might sort of make a sarcastic remark somewhere Mm. along the way and then bada bim straight into law yeah so it sort of gets a second reading but then sort of committee and report stages are all sort of pushed through very quickly and uh, then we sort of have to see what happens next is there there going to be full-blooded finance bill one assumes so given the number of changes that the government indicated and it published at the end of the chancellor's statement a set of what are called ways and means motions which there was 37 of them and these are the motions that are what are called the founding resolutions for a finance bill for legislation to implement the chancellor's proposals and the house will have to approve those at the end of the debate which i think is is next monday and once it's done that then the government will be able to bring forward the bill on the basis of those founding resolutions but but even even before that of course a lot of this a lot of the measures he's announced have taken more or less immediate effect as as they do in a budget yeah, so any any whether it's a budget or an autumn statement, any of the um, the changes in duty on alcohol, fuel, cigarettes, cigarettes, and tobacco was was the big one in this statement. The concern is always once you announce those, that they're market sensitive. You don't want people stockpiling. You don't want people sort of changing prices and so on. So there's a provision in in the financial process in Parliament for what's called a provisional collection of taxes motion. And that goes through straight away. And it basically gives, without the need for full-blooded legislation, it gives parliamentary authority to the changes that the Chancellor wants to make. Now, that's temporary until they get the finance bill through, but it it comes into effect on the day of the statement. And so in in the twinkling of an eye, you're paying more for a packet of cigarettes because the duty goes up more or less instantaneously. Yeah, so it, it comes into effect that evening. And the government's got to get the finance bill to keep those measures in place. It's a temporary provision, but it it just ensures that you know you, you you don't get these sort of problems with market sensitivity issues. And th- th- there's a sort of technical difference between finance bills and other bills as well, isn't there? As you say, they're, they're brought in on a resolution, which isn't quite how normal bills work. Mm. And what difference does that make to the, the kind of the course of the, the the way these bills are considered by MPs? Well, it means that this committee stage, particularly, you see a you see a difference. So you get the you know you get a split. So some measures will be debated by the whole house. Some will be debated in public bill committee. Public bill committee is usually a lot bigger than a normal public bill committee on a on a government bill. Sort of you know I think I think it can be up to forty members something wow. like that. A bit unwieldy, um, yeah. Though, yeah. And of course, as you mentioned, though, the finance bill, the, the laws don't consider them in the same way. So they effectively have the second reading debate, and then the financial privilege of the House of Commons 
comes means that subsequent stages after second reading in the Lords are what's called sort of negative. You know, they, they just push through. And off you go. But that's, that's, that's of course, the, the technicality of how you get the stuff through. But there's, there's also plenty of debate about the actual measures that Jeremy Hunt announced and whether his sums add up and what they actually mean and what the longer term implications are for government spending and you know what's going to happen with budgets of government departments providing services like schools and hospitals a few years down the line when some of his measures really start to bite. Yeah, and it was interesting during the debate itself, there was, there was a bit of back and forth between the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin, and the Deputy Speaker, Eleanor Lang, who Harriet Baldwin was taking issue with some of the Labour opposition members, broadening the debate out and getting into things that had been sort of touted in the media in the days beforehand, but then hadn't actually been in the statement or hadn't been quite as had been presented by the media. And um, Dame Eleanor Lang gave a degree of latitude, I thought, a bit of leeway to the opposition members, given the fact so much had been had been trailed in the media. And, you know, there was a lot of debate around... Well, it's, it's our old friend, the, the, the trailing stuff in the media controversy yeah. that just seems to go on and on, as we've been talking about in numerous editions of this podcast. Yeah. You know, the uh, governments love to trail things, sometimes just to gauge the reaction, sometimes to give a little bit of a taster in advance. But they, it, it is something that really irritates speakers. And I think, uh, uh, leaving that aside, Dame Eleanor Lang isn't someone who likes to be told how to chair the House of Commons either, so I'm not sure no. it's a great idea <laughs> to suggest to her that she no. was being too permissive no. in what she was letting MPs talk about. But the other thing we could have done with the with the autumn statement, we could have had a sort of equivalent of a drinking game, checking checking <laughs> checking which journalists had got the most accurate trails and therefore had got the best sources. Yeah, indeed, I, I sometimes think that you also ought to sort of down an additional shot every time the word crackdown is mentioned, but. But what you don't get with this process, because what we've been talking about is how you put tax changes into law, what you don't really seem to get, outside of a little bit of debate anyway, is any real scrutiny of the big spending decisions. Should they be more on the NHS and maybe less on schools? Does there need to be more on defence and less on something else? Those kind of things. And this is one of the really strange things about the way Parliament, which remember, once fought a civil war over control of the, the national purse strings, that, that Parliament's control of the finances seems to almost slip through parliamentary fingers. Yeah, it's not just true of Westminster, it's also true of Westminster parliamentary systems generally, but we have one of the weaker systems for parliamentary control and influence over government expenditure and taxation, how it's how it's raised before the event scrutiny, if you like, before the, the decisions and the, the spending is, is made. Ironically, we have one of the strongest systems for looking at spending after it's happened. And we're going to talk to Meg Hillier a bit later in the programme. Um, she's chair of the Public Accounts Committee, which is one of the best regarded in the world. Parliament's waste finder general. Yeah. Article. So, so there is this anomaly. I mean, there are ideas out there about how that could be improved. It, it's not that Parliament can't do things. It's There are some procedures out there that are underutilised and there are some reforms that they could implement that would improve things. So the Procedure Committee in the last Parliament made a recommendation, for example, for a Budget Committee. The feeling was that the Treasury Select Committee, which currently looks at these issues, and we're talking about Harriet Baldwin, chair of that committee earlier, the feeling was that it has a huge agenda. Yeah, it does sort of grand macroeconomic yeah. policy, setting of interest rates yeah. and regulating the city and all those kind of yeah. things. So the, the feeling was that you'd have a dedicated Budget Committee to look at these things. Some people have suggested even a taxation committee. One of the big problems, of course, is that how the information is presented and the capacity and expertise of MPs to actually scrutinise this stuff. In, in America, in Washington, there's a Congressional Office of the Budget or something yeah, like that. Yeah, Congressional Budget Office. Westminster Parliament, I mean, Canada and Australia, they've got sort of versions of a Parliamentary Budget Office, a PBO as they're known. And there's different approaches to it in different models. I mean, certainly one of them, for example, actually scrutinises election manifestos of the political parties in advance of an election. But you, you can have some more limited than that that's that's providing support to MPs to understand the technical financial information that's that's presented I think there are improvements that could be made by the government to make that easier for MPs Parliament's got what's called the scrutiny unit which has some capacity to support financial scrutiny particularly by select committees when they're looking at things like departmental annual reports and so on but there is an argument and examples elsewhere that it could be done better by Westminster if, if there was the will. Yeah, but I think the critical thing there, as you mentioned, really, is the support mechanism, that there have to be pointy-headed institutions 
Institute for Fiscal Studies types mm. who actually understand and can take the numbers apart and mm. provide the fruit of their research to MPs because it's very difficult, I think, to be a full-time MP and a full-time economist scrutinising yeah. the gory details of government spending programmes. Yeah, I mean, to, to understand the information as it's presented now, you basically have to be an accountant and there are not many of those in Parliament. Well, continuing the theme of the autumn statement, we've come up to the upper committee corridor in the House of Commons and the office of Parliament's premier financial watchdog, the Waste Finder General, Meg Hillier, Dame Meg Hillier, chair of the Public Accounts Committee, Parliament's venerable financial watchdog that's been going since the days of William Gladstone. Meg, you spoke in the debate on the autumn statement quite early on and you dismissed what Jeremy Hunt was saying as a smoke and mirrors autumn statement. Why? Well, let's take his unveiling of a a national insurance cut. This is a government that has actually increased the tax by freezing thresholds on so many working people. And so 2% back on national insurance doesn't go anywhere near to replacing that. We've got one of the highest tax governments that we've had for decades. And then add to that, and one of the real concerns I've got, uh, as a big concern of the committee too, is the lack of investment in big capital projects. And the longer you leave these things to rot, and we've just published reports on schools and hospitals, the bigger the bill, the bigger the problem, and we're still at the foothills of resolving those two alone, let alone other major public sector building projects. And in the end, they'll just cost more. And they are things that the public sector needs to invest in. There isn't a private sector alternative. You know, so you can boost business as much as you want but there's a very hefty bill for the taxpayer for our schools, hospitals and other public facilities. And one of the complaints about the autumn statement is that the arithmetic rests on cuts yet to be made in the budgets of all the big government departments in the future that many observers simply don't think are feasible to make. It's a sort of ticking time bomb in the bowels of the government's accounts. Absolutely. If you look at the projections, the heavy costs come after 2024 or 2025 indeed. Spookily enough after the next general election. Well indeed, so there is an awful lot of traps being set there for any future government which will need to be carefully worked through. And then if you look at the settlement for government departments, it's sticking to the previously agreed 1% increase a year. That is nowhere near inflation, even though inflation has dropped. That means local government departments are effectively are going to have to make cuts, reduce their services and their costs to balance their budget. So that's, again, smoke and mirrors, hidden cuts. We don't know what that will mean yet. Each department will continue to work that through. But no prospect from what he said yesterday that there's going to be any significant increase to any government's department's day-to-day spending. So talking about putting off spending plans, let's come to the restoration and renewal project, the restoration of Parliament. So this is the long-running project to save Parliament, stop the building falling down, burning down, falling into the Thames. Your committee's been looking into it for quite a time now. You've been monitoring it. You're not happy with the current state of play. What's your understanding of where we are? Well, we were supposed to be having a vote in Parliament about the options that were in front of us in December. We now understand that's been moved back to January. But crucially, we've been looking at it in a lot of detail in the committee. We're still six years after there was a vote in Parliament that we would get ahead and start planning restoration renewal. We started all over again. So we've lost those years and we know nearer any decision on the final solution of how we're going to actually resolve this. The big sticking point is whether we have what's called continued presence or we just move out of the building. Continued presence, however, in our view, and we pushed the clerk of the House very strongly on this when he appeared in front of us recently, means that you have to have people working in here when you're ripping out asbestos, all the mechanical and engineering and all the dangerous things that will be happening on a building site. And just cost-wise, that's very expensive to do. It takes longer to do the building as a whole, and we know from all our work on the committee that the longer a project takes, the more it will cost in the end. And frankly, it's not reasonable or safe for people to be working here. And, you know, MPs are only 650 people in the building. Peers are only 850. There's the other thousands of people who work here and visit here who need to be protected. So we know we're near a decision. We don't even know what the numbers, uh, the costs are likely to be. And it feels like this is being kicked down the road yet again. And there are, of course, costs for just staying in the building and not doing all the repairs that need to be done. I mean, to be sure, there have been some measures taken, but the full-on, full-fat repair programme can't be done while MPs and peers continue to occupy the building. But keeping them there while waiting for a decision is not free either. No, we, when we looked at it previously, it was £2 million a week is being spent just keeping the building propped up. That's now dropped to £1.45 million because some big projects have happened. 
but there are other big projects in the pipeline that will need to be done just to keep the building ticking along and being safe. We spent millions of pounds on a fire detection system, which means happily for those of us sitting here now, we would get out of the building, but it wouldn't save the building. And these are all things to keep the building just about going. But look, in my own office, I've had water through the roof, cold air through the roof. There are toilets uh, and plumbing that frequently leaks, sometimes with foul water. There have been fires in this place. The corridors underneath the carpets have literal holes in the floor. And this is just the building that people have to work in day to day. That's not even beginning to look at the real guts of the building, the basement, ripping out all of the old uh, technology and, uh, and wiring and replacing that. And all, of course, the beautiful heritage parts of the building. So there's an awful lot to do and we have not got anywhere near starting that big work. But it is, you're right, very costly just to stay here for the day-to-day work that needs to keep it safe. The costs are eye-watering. So strategic review was done last year and they looked at three options. So staying in the palace, anything between 11 and 22 billion, but potentially taking somewhere between half a century and three quarters of a century. With the work going on around it. With the work going on around it. It's very difficult to see how you run a national legislature in the middle of a building site. Then the other option is a partial decant. So House of Lords would leave the building, MPs would move into the House of Lords chamber, work would go on in the Commons area, and then they would move back and the the work happened in the Lords. Again, sort of nine and a half to 18 and a half billion, something up to sort of 25 plus years. And then the full decant option, which is everybody leaves the, the palace, the estate, and that, that is consistently, we've, we've looked, had review after review after review, it's consistently the cheapest, most cost-effective option. And yet it is incredibly difficult to get MPs to agree that and stick to it. And the problem is in the previous parliament, MPs did vote for that. It's now been overturned. How do we get a decision to stick? Well, this is one of the problems. I mean, we have got a way of running this place that if it was any other body, the opacity and the lack of transparency on decisions would not be acceptable. If you're a local government, you wouldn't get away with it. And yet we don't have that transparency. But also, if you look at these eye-watering costs, we know that every project that's delayed costs a lot more money. And you can't, and we, we're saying continued presence is not practical. And we got the clerk of the house to acknowledge that if he had a disagreement with the commission, which is the body that runs this place, chaired by the speaker, he could signal his discontent by putting a letter in the library. That's very quaint and parliamentary. But actually, he is the person responsible for the health and safety of everybody working in this building. And if it was a building site, that would be his responsibility. So I think it's beginning to sink in with now the third or fourth clerk I've been dealing with on this issue, that it is absolutely falls to him to make sure that the right decision goes through. But somehow we're still playing with different options, even though we all know the most cost effective approach would be to get us all out. Can I just say on the one about moving the commons to the Lords and the Lords out, This is one building. All the mechanical and engineering is connected. All the airspace is connected. So if asbestos is found somewhere, you know, even with asbestos conditions, I don't think I'd want to be in the building when that was happening. And if you take out what you need to, the mechanical and engineering, and replace it with modern technology, then the whole building ceases to function. So you'd have to set up a whole separate structure inside the house. The complications and cost of doing that would outweigh any benefit from the work that we've done that we can can point to. It's worth saying, so our listeners understand, I mean, there's something like at the moment two and a half thousand locations where asbestos has been identified it's thought to be the the biggest sort of amount of asbestos in one building anywhere in in the country there have been a number of asbestos incidents already and how do you think that the staff and the trade unions feel because yes the clerk of the house has legal responsibility he's the sort of the corporate and accounting officer but he doesn't hold the purse strings on the decision that's government that's the treasury the vote if you like to authorize the works is the mp so the MPs and ministers have got power without responsibility and the clerk's got responsibility without power. I think you sum up the constitutional challenge uh, very well and it's exactly why one, one of the longer term things I think out of this is we do need to review the governance structures of this place. We actually did discuss back when there was a joint Lords and Commons committee to look at how setting up the original setup to, to do this work a few years ago that they might have a Treasury Minister sitting on the relevant bodies. The government didn't really want to do that as we can understand one level why but actually that means we're not stitching the Treasury in as much as we should at those early stages and they would probably bring some discipline frankly to the process. But we are a group of people in this building, the MPs, who want to run the country. We all go into elections, you know, to try and get into power. And yet we can't seem to make a decision about this place. I think for a lot of members, it's just not something they think about. Most people, you don't go to your work, Ruth, thinking uh, that you're going to have to worry about aspects of the building. You think there are people who do that. 
uh, for you. So most people aren't really thinking about it day to day. And really, the fact that 650 people who are not always as well informed as they should be about it um, are, are voting on it is a, is a ludicrous way of, of doing things, frankly. But look, it is now getting worrying to me that we've got the fires that we know happen that get caught because we've got 24 hour a day fire wardens on three shifts, seven days a week. We have the fire system that's been put in expensively to make sure that we can get out, but the building wouldn't be saved. We have many failures every week, every month, and yet these don't seem to be warning signs enough for people that we've got to get on and do this job. And it is an iconic, the mother of Parliament. So the other problem, of course, is within a general election looming, this is kicked beyond a general election. There's a whole other new parliament to discuss this. You've got the clerk of the House uh, of Commons, the clerk of the Parliament, the clerk, senior clerk in the House of Lords. You've kept coming to your committee giving evidence. But the commissions of both houses, the, the, the chief governance bodies, the political heads of those are effectively the speakers of, of each house and the leader of the House of Commons and the leader of the House of Lords. Is it not time to get them in front of the committee or is there some constitutional reason why why you can't? Well, as the Public Accounts Committee, our constitutional role is that we call the accounting officers, the people who are actually dis- responsible for day-to-day spending or delivery of projects. So we would never have politicians. We've never, in living memory anyway, ever had a politician in front of us. So there are other committees that can do that. But interesting, you mentioned the Clerk of the Parliament's in the Lords and the Clerk of the House and the two speakers. There is a difference of opinion. The Lords are saying, let's get on with this. The Commons have not. And there is just a risk. And it's everyone thinks they won't be standing when the music stops. But at some point, there will be a catastrophic moment, the music will have stopped. And someone's going to be holding the hot potato that is the Palace of Westminster, this beautiful World Heritage site. And who wants to be in that position? You can see the political issue here, that it's very difficult in incredibly difficult financial times for any government to say we're going to spend however many billion it now is on redoing the Palace of Westminster. And is that going to be any less of a problem for a Labour government if we get one after the next general election than it is for the current Conservative government? And this is something no politician wants to touch. It's kryptonite. It's radioactive. Absolutely. I mean, I have what I call the list of big nasties that are coming up that are things we've talked about at the very beginning of this, school buildings, hospital buildings, things that have been delayed, decisions that have been delayed, sometimes for decades, sometimes for a, through a government. And they are costly pressures now sitting there that were getting to the point where they need to be done and this is one of those it can't be delayed much longer it shouldn't be delayed any longer really but the reality is that that will be a pressure whichever government's in they'll always think well I could do something else with the money but actually there are also positives out of this we have up and down the United Kingdom craftspeople who've got specialist skills and talents and with some thought and planning just as we've done for other big projects you could actually build up those skills they could be exported around the world we could make this an iconic world heritage site as it is but a world-class example of how to do a heritage project everything from the project management skills to all the different crafts involved they could be selling those skills around the world and we, we've got a great reputation for heritage in this country we should be seeing this and embracing it and actually there are jobs to be had out of this there are suppliers in the UK that could be supplying goods so it could be a big boost to the economy if it's played well those numbers need to be crunched through and until we get a decision it's very hard to do that well that's the optimistic vision but having seen this saga unfold over the last decade what do you think is actually going to happen I fear there will be pressure on any new well, new MPs will perhaps be focused on other things when they get here to be honest but there'll be pressure on them not to agree something that's too costly but actually the cheapest option or the best value option I keep saying we can't use the word cheap because it's not cheap the best value option is to do it fast and get out and make sure that the building is fixed and then we move back in it's got to happen sometime we've been kicking this can down the road for 40 years and I've been here nearly half of that time we just can't keep doing that Who wants to be the government when this building burns down? How do we avoid that then? What would your advice be to Keir Starmer if he wins the next general election, to Rachel Reeves? Um, You won't be chair of the Public Accounts Committee in that parliament if it happens because the committee has to be chaired by a member from the opposition. You'd be in a position to give sound and constructive advice to them. How do we fix this? I think we need to make sure that they push to a decision because once you've got a decision then you can really look at the costings and then you need to have as part of that a real push on Parliament to make sure that it's looking at all the supply chains. You can break down everything that needs to be done in this place down to every screw and there are companies across this country that could make the screws, do the wood panelling, all of those things and that is an opportunity to create 
um, jobs and growth and opportunity in communities across the UK. So this government talks a lot about levelling up. Now, this might not on its own level up, but there are real opportunities spread far and wide. Yes, there's going to be a cost to it, but you know the cost of not doing it is huge. But until there's a decision made, they can't even phase the works. At the moment, from what we're picking up, if there's not a clear decision with costings in January, and, and we're still not sure quite what's happening there, it could be, on current projections, 2030, before even a, a shovel is in the ground or we're far properly decanted from this building. That is ridiculous. And it actually, I think it's embarrassing now for us as a nation. We have this beautiful, iconic building, the Mother of Parliaments. There's that image on New Year's Eve when Big Ben bongs and it goes around the world. That's really significant. And if this was a catastrophic failure of this building or fire, that would be also go around the world, but would send very poor signals about the ability of UK PLC and the UK government to deal with this issue. Dame Meg Hillier of the Public Accounts Committee. And just time before we go, Ruth, just to have a a quick look at uh, some of the things that are coming up in Parliament in the coming week. And of course, there's a lot of stuff to do with uh, the autumn statement. Jeremy Hunt, as we mentioned, is in front of the Treasury Committee on Wednesday. Thursday, we'll see that um, National Insurance Bill whiz through all its stages in the Commons in a single gulp, pretty much. Yep. And um, we're also, of course, on the lookout for the possibility, it's not been confirmed yet, but rumours that we will have the Rwanda Treaty, the government's response in part to the Supreme Court decision last week. So we'll have to look out for that. Yeah, definitely. And that's certainly politically radioactive for the government mm. if its own supporters aren't satisfied with whatever the measures they come up with. And a couple of interesting techno measures coming up in the House of Lords. The Autonomous Vehicles Bill, the legal framework for self-drive cars, is up in front of the Lords for its opening consideration its second reading debate on Tuesday. This is a bill that's starting in the House of Lords and will go to the Commons once peers have polished it up to a suitable sheen. And watch out also for the report of one of those special Lords Select Committees that they like so much in the Upper House, looking at a very specific subject. Robert Rogers, Lord Liz Vane, the former Clerk of the Commons, has been presiding over what I think of as the Terminator Committee, a committee <laughs> examining autonomous weapon systems and the legal and ethical implications of having basically computers deciding whether or not to shoot. And that's a really knotty problem that they've consulted all kinds of experts over for months. And I think a very interesting report mm. is going to land on a few desks next week. So with that, I think that's probably everything for this week. And um, we'll, I'll see you next week. See you then. Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. What do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting Hansard Society org.uk slash pmuq we'll be discussing them in future episodes including our special urgent questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about parliament and you can find us across social media at hansard society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the hansard society parliament matters is produced by the hansard society and supported by the joseph roundtree charitable trust For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm or find us on social media at Hansard Society.